2012 is quite an anniversary for me personally. So it's 30 years ago this month that I admitted the first AIDS patients to, to St. Mary's. Um, I'd started the clinic there back in, in August in 1982. But that was a turning point because from November 1982 onwards up till the present day, there's never been a time at St. Mary's where there hasn't been an AIDS inpatient on the wards. Uh, give some idea of the extraordinary impact this disease has had. So in, in 1994, probably our worst year in the epidemic, one patient died every working day in the hospital. Um, this year we'll have, I think, just two deaths, both patients in their 70s who died with HIV and, and not of it. So an extraordinary uh, miraculous, if you like, effect on the treatment of this disease over the course of a, of a generation. So Imperials played really quite a sort of fundamental role in, in AIDS throughout all of the epochs of, of the epidemic over the last 30 years. Initially we set up one of the very first clinics for the management of people with, with AIDS or we thought might have had AIDS in order to study the natural history. And then once the new range of drugs started to become available from 1991 onwards, we were heavily involved in the clinical trials of the very first combination antiretroviral studies, so-called Delta trial, and then in the three drug combination studies that were the ones that really cracked the management of HIV and have led to, to modern antiretroviral therapy. So the other area where we've been very active in our research at Imperial is trying to think of better ways of using the drugs. So we know the antiretroviral drugs work for individuals extremely potently. What we now need to is to ask the question, can we use them at a population level to bring down the incidence of HIV infection at a population level? And this is really a piece of work which involves clinicians, it involves epidemiologists, field workers, and it also involves our mathematical modelers and the, the, the statistical or mathematical biologists who are looking at the transmission of HIV. We have a research group here which is focusing on applied HIV epidemiology. And one of the things we do here is run the HIV modeling consortium, but we also run other projects as well, like the UNH reference group. Um, and the main aim of what we do is to try and bring the very best epidemiological research to bear on the questions which are really important for, for right now. So people around the world are having to fight the HIV epidemic in all kind of different contexts with all kinds of different limitations of resources. And we think that there's a really good way to rationalize that decision-making process and that's using analytics, mathematical modeling, stats and economics. We work a lot with uh, international organizations who make decisions about um, about HIV guidelines and kind of guidance and um, and coordinating the response to AIDS. So we do a lot of work with UNAIDS and uh, currently with the World Health Organization and also um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the CDC and the US government who fund a lot of HIV treatment programs. So the main focus of my work is on pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is um, an intervention for HIV prevention whereby uninfected individuals um, deemed to be at risk of um, infection are given um, antiretroviral drugs to reduce their risk of acquisition of HIV. And so I think one of the most useful things that we've done is we've looked at how cheap new products would need to be in order for them to be cost effective compared to scaling up other interventions. So I think that this is one of the most relevant questions which we can pose. So I'm mostly interested in HIV transmission among key populations, so people who are more at risk of acquiring HIV because of their um, sexual behaviour and social circumstances and structural uh, issues. 
Uh, so I've been focusing mostly on key populations in Latin America. So studying, uh, for instance, HIV transmission in prisons. I've mostly focused on one big prison in Peru. And I've also looked at the impact, the potential impact of a PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis intervention among MSM in Lima, just to see what would be the most efficient way to implement a program. So I, I guess one of the most important points of doing research among key populations is to direct uh, prevention efforts and treatment efforts to the populations that are uh, like important to the epidemic. And that often doesn't happen because they are quite stigmatized and so ignored by governments. And so by producing research that shows that it's important to actually focus on this, you hope that, well, you will decrease their risk and also improve their lives somehow. Well, the most interesting part of this work, I guess, is um, seeing how this works differently from uh, all the epidemics where the transmission is generalized in the, it's in the general population and is not uh, uh, mainly concentrated in, in the groups most at risk. The modeling side is very uh, entertaining and interesting. And also um, confirming that all the assumptions and the theory you know is actually needed and, uh, and it's a very important input if you actually want to replicate epidemics in a, in a, in a system like a mathematical model. That's been really, it's, um, it's very interesting. And I would like to see my research, um, my, my research results, uh, I mean, transferred or translated into policy in a few years. Okay, we've been looking at the implications of an increased risk of HIV acquisition if you um, are using hormonal contraception. Of course, hormonal contraception is a very popular form of contraception used by millions of women across the world. So is, is that a serious issue? Um, uh, it is potentially. In certain countries in the world, if you have a high level of HIV um, and um, a high level of uh, hormonal contraception or injected hormonal contraception, then yes, it is potentially for countries like in sub-Saharan Sahara Africa. In other countries where there are low levels of HIV, and um, high levels of uh, injected hormonal contraception, then it would be more, there would be more maternal deaths and uh, if you were to remove a, a good form of contraception. So it depends where you are in the world as to how important the implications are of the, of the increased risk of HIV acquisition with contra hormonal contraception. You know, the work that we do is to try to say, uh, how could we best use the resources that we have? What, what would be the case that would be made for um, for more resources, what could we do if there was a bit more funding? And I think that that's um, uh, really interesting and hopefully useful and important to both countries and to the uh, international funders. So I think this is a really exciting time, you know, for global health in general and HIV in particular. I think there's a real momentum, you know, building. I think that the science has, you know, given us a great platform which to work. And now it's a question of, you know, being very pragmatic and thinking about operational issues and programmatic issues and I think if we can get that right over the next few years and a lot of our work is trying to support that then you know, we really could be at some kind of turning point.